you. Um, well, first of all, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm uh, originally from Israel, and I only moved, uh, I moved to the States about three years ago. Um, but about six months after I moved, I met this wonderful woman um, who's now my wife. And she's actually from uh, South Minnesota, so that's not very far away. And uh, through that, I got to travel quite a, quite a bit uh, in the Midwest since then, and I love the people, and I was very excited to come to an event like this. So uh, I'm very proud to take part in the uh, Silicon Prairie uh, initiatives. Um, so a little bit about Boxy just uh, at the beginning. Um, we started the company at the beginning of 2007. Uh, I don't know if you remember exactly, but that time was exactly when uh, internet was fast enough to start uh, transferring video files. That was kind of 2006, 2007 was when we started actually downloading uh, content from the internet. Uh, just the beginning of YouTube, uh, not yet Netflix, uh, not yet uh, Hulu. Um, since then, we grew. We're about 50 people now. We have an office in New York and Tel Aviv, and we've raised just, a, it's not very important, but we've raised $28 million um, since then. So, TV. Um, people love TV, and we also love TV. This is, uh, well, this is actually, this was us in the office watching the Super Bowl last year, um, and we have a big party for that every year. Um, but something uh, was a little bit broken for us uh, about TV. Um, we felt that it's changing, the way we consume it is changing, but TV is not adapting fast enough to what we, wanna, what we want it to be. Um, it's still, if you look at it, it's still uh, the thing that we do the most, uh, way more than anything else. Uh, sadly, actually, probably even way more than we should. Uh, for most of us. Um, it's a huge business. It's a $162 billion uh, business, and probably even more than that. Uh, that's kind of just advertising and, uh, and subscription to uh, cable. Um, but internet is kind of taking over. We have a bunch of other alternatives uh, in terms of content. We have content from the TV migrating into internet. We have alternative content emerging from the internet. Um, I don't know if you've been following YouTube lately, but they're investing a lot. They've kind of uh, migrated or uh, graduated from the user-generated content that they used to uh, serve us, and they understand that they can generate uh, many more uh, views for them for their content if they actually uh, focus on um, produced uh, high quality of production and interesting um, content, which might be a little bit more uh, diversified in terms of niches, but uh, still is much more attractive. So internet is definitely taking over. And um, we've seen what happens actually when internet takes over an industry, right? So um, it <coughs> tends to blow up. And it's not very nice if you don't know how to uh, respond. So music industry, pretty much uh, tanked because of the internet. Uh, and again, if you look at it, it's exactly at that point in time where the internet gets to this uh, critical mass that actually allows um, an industry to get disrupted. Um, publishing, um, anything that has to do with uh, actual revenues is just uh, completely uh, disappearing into thin air. Um, so what, we, what happened in, in, in 2007 is that we decided to create a piece of software uh, that was the Boxy software. It was a media center. So uh, you could download the software, put it on a device or in your laptop, connect it to your TV, and start consuming content uh, on the big screen, but just not from your regular cable, but actually what you want to see from the internet. So either content that you ripped from your DVDs or that your friends brought to you on a hard drive, uh, stuff that you downloaded from the internet, or content that started emerging, um, streaming content. Uh, and it was pretty successful. We released uh, the first uh, software for Mac and Windows at the mid-2008. Within six months, um, that was our private beta. We had 100,000 downloads. Now, it might not sound a lot these days where uh, you know mobile software can skyrocket in, uh, in uh, less than a year to 
uh, tens of millions, but back then it was a lot. And actually it is, if you think about it, it's not just downloading an app, taking a look at it, and then moving on. It's taking your computer, putting a software on it, connecting it to the TV, actually using it. That's quite significant. Uh, within a year we had a million users, and probably the most significant thing that actually happened to us was where someone from the community, our software was open sourced. We based it on an open source product, project, and it was open sourced. So uh, at some point, uh, someone from the community actually managed to get that software on an Apple TV. And I don't know if you remember, but when Apple released their first Apple TV devices, um, they were nice, but nothing to write home about. Uh, there wasn't really a lot to do with them. They pretty quickly turned into these paperweights. And then suddenly when there was something that could open it up, get you out of that closed garden of Apple, um, and most significantly probably was that you, can go, you could get internet content and you could get Hulu um, on that uh, device, uh, people were very excited about it. We had uh, about 400,000 active users using it on an Apple TV. That was probably about a quarter of the Apple TVs out there using Boxy's software instead of what was uh, of Apple software. That was very, very significant. Now, when we started the company, we actually wanted to build uh, hardware. We wanted software, but we understood that software enough uh, alone is not enough. Uh, there, we're going to hit some kind of a glass ceiling where we're not going to be able to get more um, users using the software. And in order to get, into, to get into people's houses, we need some kind of a terrain force. And that should be hardware. Um, sadly, there's, not, there's no open platform like our phones these days. There's no open platform uh, in the living room right now. Um, probably everyone has some kind of a CPU in their living room. You have a game console. You have a set of box, which is a very uh, rudimentary uh, type of a CPU that, again, is very closed. Um, you maybe have a streaming device, but none of them are open to other types of software, other types of experience, customizing it. Um, so we had to build our own uh, Torian horse. So we started with software because uh, it was just too expensive and no one really wanted to invest in us if we were doing hardware. One of our investors said, you know, if you put away, if you put aside for a second the idea of making hardware, I'll, I'll, I'll back you up. Let's start with software and see where that leads us. So after a wonderful year where we got these wonderful numbers, we actually made hardware. So D-Link, which was our partner, they came to us. Um, it was CES 2009. CES is the biggest uh, consumer electronics show in, uh, in Vegas. And they came to us and said, uh, you know, we see the success. We want to be part of what's going on in this industry, and we would like to put your software on the device. So we built the BoxyBox. Uh, BoxyBox started selling exactly two years ago, actually almost exactly to the day, it was 17th of October, and um, it's been doing great. Um, but we always had this problem, so the BoxyBox was a very tech-savvy device. It was uh, focused at uh, early adopters that most of them were still kind of pirates probably, uh, downloading content from the internet, or maybe reaping their own DVD collections, but still, you need to be pretty technical to do that. Uh, there, was, there is a lot of internet content, so there's Vudu, there's Netflix, there's YouTube, there's Vimeo, there's about 300 apps that allow you to access content from the internet. But something is missing. Um, and what's missing is the major TV content that's currently available on something like cable. People are still missing that. Um, and, you know, if you look at the TV industry, it's still, the internet hadn't, it's, it hasn't been disrupted in the way that we, we think it should have been. Um, it's still there, and it's still hanging on. Um, and, but we think that now we have, we have a solution, and we've managed to crack that in some way. So there is a problem with content. Most of the content is still very much locked. Uh, the TV industry has managed to keep its, its, its lock on content because of we're not going to get into it, but there is this deadlock between the MSOs, the cable providers, and the content providers, studios, and the networks. And it's very hard um, to actually move into a world where everything is pay-per-view, or you can choose and pick and choose your own channels. And we still, all of us, need to pay so much for, for cable channels. But there's one little hole in that um, uh, wall, which is the broadcast channels. So we're all or actually 90% of the households in the US are paying uh, over $75 a month for cable, where at the end of the day, most of what we're watching is actually available for free. Uh, since 2009, those rabbit ears that you know, we might remember from the 70s and the 80s are actually digital. 
and the quality there is in HD, it's actually better quality than cable because it's not compressed as much as cable compresses their video signals. And you can get ABC, CBS, Fox, NBC, PBS, CW, ION, Univision, um, and a bunch of uh, other uh, channels, and all of that is completely free. So if you look at it, then actually most of what we're watching is actually on broadcast. Um, 89 of the top 100 shows are on broadcast. 80% uh, or 95 of the top uh, viewed uh, programs or events like the Emmys, the Grammys, the Oscars, um, most of the playoffs, uh, obviously th Super Bowl, all of the debates that we're all watching, everything is actually on broadcast. It's not on cable TV. Um, and 80% of the DVR recordings are actually from broadcast TV. So most of what we're consuming is free out there. Why are we paying so much for it? Uh, and and this, is, this is actually what our cable videos are gonna look like in the next, next 20 years uh, or, or 10 years. And look at what we're paying now and look what, at what we're going to pay. It's just been creeping up and not to mention horrible, horrible <laughs> service. I, I'm sure you all know uh, what it takes actually both to get connected to cable and to get disconnected from cable. It's a, it's a miserable experience. Um, and then in the middle, every time it stops working. So that, that got us thinking a little bit um, that if you look at cable today, then there's the broadcast, which again, free. Free, it's all around us, it's completely free. Um, and then it has cable channels. So there's main, you know, there's the main content, the, there's the mainstream content, which is, which is broadcast, and then there's the niche content, which is cable. And it might be HBO, and it might be Showtime, and it might be AMC. And yes, it's also ESPN, by the way, which is very important for some of the people. But it's not that important for most of the people. Um, and what we could actually do is we could have a solution which gives you both uh, broadcast and niche. But our niche is going to be a little bit different. Our niche is going to be um, coming from the internet. So yes, first of all, some of that niche content is actually pretty similar to the niche content that's currently on cable. Um, it's, uh, it's things like Vudu and Netflix and uh, Amazon or Hulu. And all of those things are very similar to the content that you're getting on, uh, on cable. Some of them are paid by subscription. Some of them are pay per view. Um, but add up the numbers, you're never gonna get to 80 or $90 a month, even if you watch yourself to death on one of these services. Um, and uh, things like ESPN are still a problem. It's definitely, we're not gonna be able to solve it for everyone. But you remember what we were talking about? It's a $160 billion industry. Even if we can take just a tiny bite out of that industry uh, to start with, that's, that's gonna make us, uh, that's gonna make a pretty big difference for people, and it's gonna create a pretty big and sustainable uh, business for us. So um, when we look at it, this is kind of how we see it. So, oh, just a second. We will give you over-the-air broadcasting with Netflix and Voodoo and a bunch of other niche content, and that's compared to the $75 that you're paying to cable. That's about $8 for Netflix and then whatever you watch on, on Voodoo or Amazon and the rest is free. Um, and the boxy box is currently available for 100, uh, it, this sounds a little bit like a sales pitch, I'm really not selling it. I mean, I'm explaining what was, what, kind of what happened to the company uh, and how we got to where we are, but just this is what eventually we created. Um, it's this box that has uh, an antenna connection at the back um, that you actually purchase separately. I mean, you need to buy both. Um, but then you get all of those channels um, and you get internet content and you can have, you can watch the content that you have at home, so personal video content. And all of that is in a very slick uh, experience that's much snappier and much nicer than any set of box that you currently have uh, from your cable provider. And I can tell you a lot about it, but obviously this has been available for almost, I mean, the box has been available to, for two years. We released the over-the-air extension to the box about a year ago. and. I can't tell you a lot about what's going to happen, but very, very soon um, we'll have some news uh, that will probably be, uh, we, we've been working on some new things. We've released 
a service called Cloudy um, that is a, a personal video uh, storage in the cloud. So all of that stuff that we've seen people that, that they have it at home, all of that video, and it's been growing and growing and growing, and they have stuff, uh, they have content on their phones. We wanted them to migrate it also into the network, and we'll be connecting some, some of these things together and we'll create some new services uh, in the very near future. Uh, our experience is far superior than anything you know uh, or used to right now. If you go, for instance, to watch live TV on Boxy, then you can actually see, so let's say you go to see How I Met Your Mother. You can see that there's other episodes of How I Met Your Mother that are available through the CBS website or through, for free or through Vudu for $1.99. You can see that your friends are actually watching that right now because everything is connected through the internet. There's these wonderful things that actually most of the cable companies are providing us with, but they're not making any real use of it. So there's no problem of connecting us with our friends and letting us know if they've watched that episode or maybe they're watching it right now. Or when I was tuning into the debate uh, a couple of weeks ago or last week, uh, and I could see that all of my friends are watching that. And that was very exciting and being able to tune in, see that 50 of my friends are watching that on Boxy right now and be able to tweet with them and uh, converse about it. Uh, these are the kind of experience that we should uh, expect from a TV and not what we get today. Um, I think that's about it. Oh, yeah, do you, do you know, so I was mentioning that probably for someone who's a sport fanatic, it's not gonna really be relevant. So there's about 100 million households that have cable today in the US, 50% of them have ESPN. Only 50% of them watch, so more, the, more, of them actually, more than that actually have ESPN, but only 50% of them watch ESPN um, more than once a month, which is an interesting number. You'd think it's much more than that. Um, about 25 of them subscribe to HBO, Showtime, and other uh, cable channels. Uh, and then there's some, also some news networks. But at the end of the day, there's still a huge addressable market that we can reduce their bills. If you look at the uh, average household expense, um, cable is actually the third largest um, for a household after a car, uh, usually after a car and a third or fourth, after a car and a, and a mortgage. So just thinking of, you know, especially in these kind of times where we're talking about uh, the economy all the time, being able to reduce something so significant uh, and, and create a better alternative. I think that's uh, very uh, exciting to be in that business. That's about it. Um, obviously, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, lessons learned. As, you, as you've seen through uh, what I was describing, we've had a pretty, uh, we, have a lot of, we had a lot of ups and downs through the way. We've started with wanting to, wanting to build a hardware device. We ended up building a software. We partnered with someone in order to build a hardware device. We ended up building another piece of hardware connecting to it in order to take advantage of something uh, that we didn't think was available when we started the company. Um, so as you uh, build a company, and definitely through six years of, uh, of being out there, there's a lot of adaptations that you need to do along, along the way. Every day you wake up and there's something else that, that you, need, you might need to consider. There's a, something that you need to change. What you thought six months ago that your product is going to be is actually completely wrong uh, or maybe has completely shifted because the market has changed. Uh, but it, what's interesting is, ac is actually that at the end of the day, your greater vision that you started with, and that's why in some, you know, Brad was talking about that 20-year uh, goal. And he was talking about it from some different perspective, more, I think, on kind of a life uh, uh, goal. But I think that also for a company, just being able to paint a big enough target and far enough in the future uh, and always kind of have that as your compass is very important. Um, a lot of companies these days start with small ideas, which are fine. I think it's great to start with something and iterate as fast as possible. But as long as you have some kind of a compass, something that at least you know there's this market that you would like to disrupt, there's this opportunity that you'd like to address, it's great. Your business is definitely, your product is definitely going to pivot around um, for a while until you figure out what exactly is the right uh, direction. How exactly are you going to make money? How exactly are you going to get your users? How exactly are you going to get traction? How exactly are you going to get partners? But uh, at the end of the day, it's very important to just keep that bigger goal in mind in order to not lose that north. That's about it. Uh, if you have any questions now.
A round of applause, please. All right, for any questions, please line up between the two microphones. I want to ask the first question, if that's okay. I mean, you have a background with the Israeli Defense Forces. How, if at all, does that help you as an entrepreneur in your critical thinking? So, uh, actually, I need to think about that, how it helps me in my critical thinking. Um, but what it definitely helped me is building a community. So, again, uh, related to uh, what uh, Brad was talking about. In Israel, so we started the company, uh, we were actually five co-founders. Um, all of us were in the army together in different combinations through along the way. Uh, we've served between three and six years, each of us, and that's where our community was, was started. That's, that's, that's the community also in Israel. Um, the army played a big role for all of us in, the, the, in forming our education and our thinking in an innovative way, but then also uh, bringing together with other like-minded people and talented people. So um, it's interesting, but these days there's actually in Israel, there's incubators that for um, each of the different units in the army, they have their own incubators. The, the alumni have started incubators helping people that graduate from those units after three, so there's a three year mandatory service, uh, if you don't know that. In Israel there's a three year mandatory service for men, two year for women. Uh, and a lot of times, especially when you get uh, uh, educated in some specific profession, um, you, you need to serve a little more. Then once you go out into the market, uh, a lot of those people end up working for some corporate um, with those skills. But especially the alumni understand the potential of that critical thinking, that entrepreneurship, that different disruptive uh, thinking, and they want to help build more businesses. So I think that that's what's very interesting, being able to have those friends from the army uh, with you along the way. We'll start right over here, please. So I remember buying a computer in 1998, used to get that cardboard thing that said Netflix in it, and uh, it wasn't until like 2007, 2008, you know, it was never called go to the post office and get your movies flicks, it was always called Netflix. So they had this forward vision that technology was finally able to catch up to them. And um, I work for a broadband provider and we're putting 40 megs into neighborhoods, 100 megs with fiber to the home right here in Iowa. And where does that help you or what is your next leap for technology or what's restricting you from going to the next level? So it's, you know, it's interesting. Because we're right now, for instance, what we're doing is uh, we're working with some companies like Netflix, which are obviously seeing things in a very uh, forward uh, way. And then we're also taking advantage of the loophole of these broadcasts that are going over the air, which is, by, by the way, it's a pretty efficient way of delivering uh, about 20 megabits of per channel of video content, which, is, which wouldn't be that efficient if you'll do it on the internet. But still, it's an intermediate technology. At the end of you know, at the end of the road, I think that everything should come through that fiber. And for all kinds of reasons, and for these incumbents that are uh, at the moment um, doing whatever they can to not move that, you know, not to move that, that not get, not let other people uh, take a piece of their cake. Um, this is the way we should, we, we're doing this. But at the end of the day, I hope that at some point, all of that broadcast is going to just run on the internet completely free, uh, or you know for instance, uh, supported with ads or whatever it is right now, right? Because it still is free. Um, but just not through an antenna, which does feel a little bit like an old technology. If you look at my Twitter feed, you'll see that I hate my cable company. So Wonderful. I, I hope you kick their ass. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Here's my question. So um, you should just cut the cord. Why are you disconnecting? <laughs> ESPN. But okay, so if I, if I rip a movie or I, I, I record something digitally, is there a business opportunity for you to allow me to have that? I own that recording to share that with family or friends. Is there policy or licensing things that stops you or me from doing that? Yeah, so in terms of uh, policy, we, it's illegal. 
it's somewhere on the gray zone for you to rip it because you are allowed in some way to create a copy for your own use, but um, you cannot, theoretically, you cannot share that with other people. So we can't help you with doing that. Uh, obviously, there's enough solutions out there. I mean, probably the most popular cloud storage solution like Dropbox will allow you to do that pretty easily. It's not built for that. It's not optimized for that. It's not great for that. But that's, again, by the way, where uh, the industry is not thinking forward. Because in some way, if you look at Spotify today, you know, I'm, I'm in love with these kind of services. Before, I had to manicure and curate and reap my whole collection. It's, it's weird, by the way, because when, for instance, um, I also listen to some Hebrew music. So when I go to Israel, I get some of the new music that's coming out, and then I bring it home. And actually, last time I went to Israel, I came back, I don't even have a, DVD, a CD drive anymore. My MacBook Air doesn't, I don't have where to put that thing. The, the music is not available on Spotify. So there is a problem there. And for instance, I would like my wife to watch some Israeli movies. Those are not available on Netflix. They're not available on Voodoo. They're not available digitally. So what, I sh what should I do? Get them on DVD? So the world is still moving very slowly, and it's mostly because of these incumbents kind of, you know, very much afraid of uh, disrupting themselves. Um, but that's the classic innovator dilemma. Um, so if they're not going to disrupt it, we're going to disrupt it as much as we can right now. But uh, the regulations around these things tend to change, and let's hope it would change for the favor of both of us. All right. Uh, my name's Ben, uh, and uh, I'm the geek in the audience with the Google Fiber t-shirt. Uh, so uh, let me ask a Google Fiber question. This might be kind of a little bit specific and a little out of your field, but sure. you know, Kansas City is getting Google Fiber, and one of their offerings is Google TV, which sure. is uh, all over optical fiber. So. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you see uh, things like Google TV um, changing the role of TV in the future, and, and, and how does that play into what Boxy is doing? Does it play well? Does it not play well? That kind of thing. So I don't know if you know exactly. Well, I don't think that anyone, anyone at the moment already has um, Google Fiber at home, it's, right? It's, it's, still, it's just starting. It's not live. Not yeah, live. End of October. So no one really played with it. But from what I know, the Google TV you're going to get through Google Fiber yep. is not the Google TV that Google announced two years ago and has been um, selling uh, since. It's uh, actually a regular cable service. Um, I don't know. It might have a little prettier UI. At the end of the day, you'll have to buy into bundles, which are very similar to what cable is today. It's actually not even the Google TV software. It's a different software stack. They're not going to run on Google TV, which beats me. I don't know why they're doing that. Like, it makes sense that if you have a Google TV product, you migrate it into supporting also um, cable content if you're going to have fiber, and that's your, what you decided to do. But the, obviously, that's not what they decided to do. They were doing something else. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that it's a little bit being all over the place and not exactly going in the right direction um, from a user perspective and from a consumer, uh, uh, from your best interest. Um, but again, I don't know enough. I would love, look, this fiber is probably the most awesome thing that can happen. Like, I love the fact, the, the best thing that we can do is just have fiber going to everyone's houses and probably if we can do it for free, that's the best thing that can happen to our economy. Um, but, being able to get you some relevant content on top of it, then I don't know, Google will do something. I think that by the fact that you'll have that whatever, 100 or gigabit pipe, it will create a lot more disruption and innovation. So whatever content you're going to get from them, it's probably going to be uh, not, not going to matter that much compared to everything else that you get. So I, I, I'm, I'm happy and I'm, I'm excited to wait for what's going to happen yeah. once you have a gigabit internet. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a pretty specific question, I guess. Uh, how long do you think before I'll be able to legally watch Game of Thrones new episodes on my Boxy? Uh, so first of all, currently on Boxy, we have an HBO Go app, oh, you do? which allows you to watch it as long as you have an HBO account. Right. Um, <laughs> now, apparently, what, what HBO has recently announced is that in in the Nordic countries, they're going to start um, uh, distributing or having an HBO Go service, uh, which is going to be paid for through the internet, kind of like Netflix subscription, and not uh, tied to a cable subscription. Uh, and I think that's that's going to be uh, pretty swell. I don't think I don't see it happening 
that, that, you know, that's soon here, um, but I'm definitely routing for that. Services like Voodoo tend to have some of the content available. I don't remember now if Game of Thrones was available when it was on. Some other types of content are available, um, but you and me were in the same problem. You know, we're in the same boat. I'm, I'm sorry. I would love to see that solved. Uh, how do you deal with, so I've been using your software for a long time, since back when, it would, when you would click three buttons and it would crash. So and it, back then at least, it was a, there was a lot Thank of hacks going on as far as getting that content into the, into the system, as far as I could tell from a user perspective. How do you deal with working that in a, in a situation where you know, anything you do could just break the next morning, you wake up more, the next morning and it's not working, your users are upset. How do you deal with doing that until you can get some part, proper partnerships and support into place? So the one thing which is not always easy, by the way, is being very patient with our users. Um, they can be very demanding, and they can be uh, sometimes even very annoying. Um, <laughs> but you have to embrace them and love them. And you have to listen to them and nourish them, because they're your customers. And they're your, you know, they're your best uh, support uh, when you're just starting and when they, you click three buttons and everything crashes. So what we do is, on one hand, we try and communicate what, you know, what the problem is and how it's going. And we try and slowly move forward. The one trap that every startup can uh, fall into is listening a little bit too much to users and not listening enough to its own you know, uh, um, goal or its own vision that we talked about. Because sometimes you can get trapped in that very short-term uh, uh, feedback loop instead of, of looking forward. Um, and that's, that's a balance you need to know how to kind of step through. Thank you. So I, I'm one of the hardware geeks in this room. I've never owned a DVR, mainly because I built my PVR eight or nine years ago, and I've enjoyed it immensely. The, the problem that you solved through your software was to enable people like me to continue watching the stuff I wanted to watch. Um, your software probably took advantage of a jailbroken Apple TV. Um, then, yes. There are half a dozen other devices that support those kinds of open systems. So as, and, and maybe you've solved the problem with the, with the boxy box. And if you'd shown the back of the box, maybe my question would be irrelevant. But, uh, but why not build an open source box and sell it to the, the segment of the market that is interested in this kind of a solution. An open box that people can write applications for. So if I want to connect four HD home run tuners, I can connect them over an Ethernet jack. Uh, if, I, if Amazon Video On Demand comes out and somebody wants to write an interface to this open source box, they can write the VOD uh, streamer for that box. Yeah. Um, so it's a very controversial subject in our company uh, as well. Um, how open should we be? And at the end of the day, and by the way, it's also I, it's a little bit controversial for me because what I'll say now is that you need to, you need to take a page from from Apple's book and see, for instance, what they did with uh, with the iPhone. So I'm saying that because I'm currently very mad at Apple because I think they made a few very stupid moves uh, with the new iPhone. Um, but on the other hand, um, they created an open platform that anyone can write apps to, but it's still very much safeguarded, they make sure that the apps work properly. They try and put guidelines for how apps should look like. They try and help the community innovate on apps. Um, it's not always the right way to do something, but it's the right way to create a mass market product. Um, if you look at Android, then it's doing great, but at the end of the day, from an Android developer perspective, to develop something for Android and know that you're gonna reach 100% of the Android community, it's almost impossible because there's so many variants on the devices. There's so many variants in the software, on the operating system, on the form factor. And that's exactly what can happen if you do something like that. The, your ability to create a solid, reliable product when the software is completely open, when you can go and tinker around with the hardware, connect some other, for instance, HD home runs to it, write some more software that handles that, it's not that easy and create it in a very low price or as low as possible. Um, 
So you need to make compromises. I can tell you that from our perspective, for instance, BoxyBox was aimed a little bit too much at the tech savvy and not saying that there, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's us. But we've looked a little bit too much under the lamp and we're looking for what kind of users we are instead of looking at the broader market. If you look at uh, uh, Roku or Apple TV, they've done very, very well in terms of sales. And that's mainly because it's just, it's a very, it's dumb, it's a simple, simple, dumb device that anyone can use and still does the job. It's not as sleek, it's not as nice, it's not as fast, it's not as scalable, it's not as open, sure. But it gets the job done for that segment of people. And it turned to be a mass market. That segment of people turned to be way bigger than we thought. Um, and, in, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it took, it, was, it happened way faster than we thought. So that's a lesson that we've learned, I think. Uh, that at the, near, the end of the day, if you want to look, again, at a, at a bigger market, you need to look at more people and less at the tech savvy community, as much as they're our best users. I, I think, uh, thank you for that. But I think in audiences like this, you're going to find more and more of the non-consumers, uh, the guys who are willing to tinker with stuff and, and create something out of your product that the product was not originally intended to do. Apple TV, Roku are a means to an end for us. They're consumer level products. Uh, they suck as products. They can't be extended. You're right. But let me give you the, a very straight answer. It sucks when you can't make money. That's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so Ted just took all of my questions, so. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please yeah. give it up. Thank you very much.